Thank you very much, uh, Pane Direktorze, uh, Panie Ponowie. Uh, this is all what I say in Polish, and I will switch to English. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, this is actually the result of uh, some talks in July this year, where we discussed uh, whether I could talk about some topics, and this is uh, the first one. Maybe there are some, some more. Um, yes, I would like to introduce myself, and uh, of course I didn't want to have the butter from the bread. Um, and uh, you actually should actually look to the screen. Um, I'm not a scientist, and I, I'm, I'm not a historian. This is important to know, um, because uh, what I'm telling you is much out of my personal experience. Um, neither am I a politician. Uh, I'm just a simple infantry officer. I'm saying this, that you don't expect from me political statements. I have my personal opinions, of course. The fact that I'm wearing a uniform, however, means that I have some restraints concerning political expressions. And at the end, you can ask me everything. You may not get an answer on everything. I kindly ask you for your understanding for that. The question for me was, who are you? Are you somebody as an individual? who is a pessimist, always seeing the glass half empty? Are you an optimist, seeing the glass always half full? And this would be my corner, being more a realist. In this case, why is the glass filled with pissed? I can tell you there, this is a drastic outcome. Um, there are nicer perception imaginable, and I hope you agree with me at the end of my briefing. I'm working in this building. To the left, this is the Joint Force Training Center in Bitgosh in Poland. I am the special advisor to Major General Wilhelm Grün, the German commander of this NATO installation um, in Bitgosh, which is now called the NATO capital of Bitgosh, an expression we did not invent. It was invented by the mayor of Bitgosh because in the meanwhile we have a couple other NATO installations around. And this is my bio. And, um, you can quickly fly over it, uh, you are all literate. I will not go to all of this in the detail. Actually, uh, because uh, we will come to some of the stations during my briefing. Educational wise, I attended uh, the Armed Forces University in Munich. I have graduated from several courses at the Armed Forces Staff College, uh, the Armed, uh, Armed Forces Command and Staff College in Germany in Hamburg, the Netherlands Army Staff College, the United States Infantry School and the United States Defense University and the NATO School. In my two last assignments prior to my current one, I was respons responsible for development and delivery of integrated peace support operations training in West Africa and the coordination of deployment training for German soldiers preparing for missions worldwide. So I could say humbly that I was allowed to collect some experience. What is this presentation all about? I will repeal some of these periods as they coincide with the developing history of these decades uh, since 1974. And I want to share my memories and perceptions with you, linking them with selected events of global significance. For that, I will dare to open my private photo album. You are allowed to laugh seeing me how I was looking 40 years ago. I don't mind, especially since I have an imagination how you may look like in 40 years from now. You're all still young. To line up all regional of global events of significance during these 44 years would have by far exceeded this lecture. What you see here is only my personal selection, which of course would not withstand any scientific claim. Even then it did not fit at one slide. I have therefore split the period into two halves. 1974 till 2000 and 2001 till today. Left side, you can see my career assignments. On the right side, they mentioned events that I will guide you through with a virtual lightsaber if you want so. The ones highlighted in red mean a greater significance to me and the yellow blocks are the one of which I will draw some consequences at the end because I'm of the belief that they are of overriding importance for our present time and the near future. In this time frame, which you see here, there is one. And this is the fact that Vladimir Putin came to power in Russia at the 31st of December 1999 at the edge of the new 
millennium. Again, the outstanding events in red at the second part from 2001 to today, and only one of overriding importance again, and this is the European migrant crisis, which started in 2015 with all the consequences. So let's go. That's me in 1974. Yes, I was not born with bold head. Maybe I was, but I got hairs later. So why did I become a soldier? First, because we had a compulsory military system in West Germany anyway, as in most Western European countries by then. And a conscientious objection against the Cold Paltry Service was out of my thinking because of my education. The question should therefore better read, why did I apply to be accepted as an officer candidate? The answer is quite simple. This, the global situation of the Cold War in these days, was definitely not the reason why I became a soldier. After 13 years in school and a strict parental home, I wanted to smell action and adventure, whilst at the same time earn some money and relish an academic education. So I decided that I want to become a paratrooper. I was accepted and taken into training, and I can assure you that I had a very great time these days. However, along with the officer's training, reality of life caught me up, and militarily, the reality of life meant Cold War with all the consequences it can bring for infantry units in the Western Front state between the Cold Warring blocks. And as you can see by then, it was West and East Germany. I was born, raised, and now stationed in southern Germany. And I had to realize that this area of Germany was one of the cornerstones in the NATO defense planning. Especially here was seen the high threat at the border of two NATO high command areas by then, AFSEND, which is Allied Forces Central Europe, and AF South, Allied Forces Southern Europe, of a fast attack and deep advance of Warsaw Pact units from Czechoslovakia through Bavaria to the River Rhine. The neutrality of Austria and Switzerland added to the complexity. This possible gateway had to be in permanent consideration. It had the code name Der Fall Süd, the Fall South, the case South. And it was a synonym of alternative defense planning of the Second German Corps for the case that Moscow would break the neutrality of Austria and Switzerland. The few into the operation plans of NATO, which were kept secret until not so long ago, shows that the defense of Western Europe against the massive Warsaw Pact attack was aimed at an early involvement in nuclear weapons, despite the policy change from massive retaliation to flexible reaction. Thanks to God, that has never happened and was spared to all of us. Otherwise, we would not be together in this room. A little anecdote in these times. I had my foxhole, so to say, from infantry somewhere down there at the border to Austria. And we had always trained our squad leaders to look at the position, the infantry position from the enemy side. Is the camouflage OK? Are the lines of support secured and so on? And since we had a regular personal turnover, we went there regularly. With tactical signs that the cars covered because the Soviet military mission in civilian cars was present there as well, as Western military missions had to ride to drive to also Park State, of course. So one day, I got, during one of these exercises, the information from the police that the Austrian border police had arrested a German non-commissioned officer on the Austrian side together with his chief, which was, of course, strictly forbidden. He wanted to check his positions from the enemy side. Until today, I have no clue how he went there. And we were lucky to get him out and back without further diplomatic quarrels. That's also me. A couple of years later, platoon commander in the Dark Battalion of the German Ministry of Defense in Bergisch Gladbach, not far from Bonn, which was by then the seat of government in the Federal Republic of Germany and the provisorial capital. I'm showing this because it was one of my first uh, meetings with a Pole, and in this case, John Paul, John Paul Paul, that's me, of course, the Paul, the Pope is easy to identify. That was one of my extraordinary highlights during my time in the Guard Battalion to participate in this honor formation on the 15th November 1980. We are in this year 1980. You can see my little lightsaber here showing you where we are. 
The Soviet-Afghan war had begun in December 1979. Uh, Insurgent groups known collectively as Mujahideen fought a guerrilla war against the Soviet army and the Democratic Republic of Afghanistan government, mostly in the rural countryside of Afghanistan. The Mujahideen groups were backed primarily by the United States, Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, making it a proxy war already then. Meanwhile, in Germany, I had to sell the so-called NATO double-track decision to my soldiers during the training hours, which were called Staatsbürgerli Unterricht, best to translate as civic education. And we had to teach, for example, how our parliamentarian democratic political system was working. And I remember I was struggling with this NATO double-track decision. It was prompted by the continuing military buildup of Warsaw Pact, particularly Warsaw Pact's growing capability in nuclear systems. Of special concern was the growth of long-range theater nuclear forces with the SS-20 missiles, which you can see on the left side, and the backfire bombers here at Tupolev Tu-22M. The European NATO members saw in the mobile launching platform mounted SS-20 missiles no less than a threat um, of these strategic intercontinental uh, missiles and on December 1979 took the so-called NATO double-track decision. This decision intended the deployment of 572 equally mobile American middle-range missiles, Pershing-2, which you see on the right side, and ground-launched cruise missiles as well on the right side, to rebuild the state of mutual assured destruction. This is something you have to think twice mutual assured destruction. NATO offered immediate negotiations with the goal to ban nuclear armed middle range missiles from Europe completely with the provision that same, the same missiles should be, could be installed four years later if negotiations failed. The Soviets were critical that neither French nor British nuclear weapons were considered in this treaty. The disarmament negotiations which started on November 30, 1981 remained without conclusion. The German parliament agreed to the deployment in 1983, whereupon the Soviet Union aborted the negotiations. Only in 1987, the US and the Soviet Union signed the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, SALT, if provided for the destruction of all middle range weapons and ended this uh, episode in the Cold War. Looking to Poland. Solidarność, the independent self-governing labor union that was founded in 17 September 1980 at the Lenin shipyard under the leadership of Lech Walesa, raised a lot of attention, sympathy in Western Europe. And I can remember that very well. Something happened there, something positive. And then on 13 December 1981 by General of the Army Wojciech Jaroselski and the Military Council of National Salvation, Wojskowa Rada, Ocalenia Narodowego, the proclamation of martial law. Appearing on Polish television at 6 o'clock in the morning on the 13 September 1989, General Jaroselski said, Today I address myself to you as a soldier and as a head of Polish government. I address you concerning extraordinarily important questions. Our homeland is at the edge of an abyss. The achievements of many generations and the Polish home that has been built up from the dust are about to turn into ruins. State structures are ceasing to function. And he ended his speech with the words, I appeal to all the citizens. A time of heavy trials has arrived. And we have to stand those in order to prove that we are worthy of Poland. Before all the Polish people and the whole world, I would like to repeat the immortal words Poland has not yet perished as long as we still live. And also, the martial law was lifted in 1983. Many of the political prisoners were not released until the general amnesty in 1986. That was something which I remember for the rest of my life. In the meanwhile, I have been posted to the headquarters of 1st Airborne Division in Bruchsal, not so far from Heidelberg. Tadeusz Masowiecki had become the first Polish prime minister as the first non-communist prime minister of an Eastern European country in over 40 years. 
Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev was the eighth and last leader of the Soviet Union. And I had my first contact with Czechoslovakian soldiers, as you can see here, and that's obviously me on the right side, in 1989. Those soldiers, which we had assumed we had to shoot as just a few years before at the southern German border in case of a war. Yes, 1989, that was the year. Why? Because it was big changes. You may remember that it started in summer 1989 with East Germans who took holidays in Hungary and then decided not to go back to the German Democratic Republic. Former Hungarian Prime Minister Nemes explained later in a documentary, no one of us forecasted it during the summer of 1989, we will have another hot potato in our hands, namely the German refugee problem. I got the first news that interestingly, after two to three weeks long holiday, some of the GDR citizens decided to stay. It was clear to me that is now a very, very serious situation. In Budapest, around the Lake Balaton, all the camping sites are fully, fully packed. Even along the road, without any facilities around them, of course. End of September and the cold weather arrives and we did not have facilities to provide. These people will die frozen during the winter. So, why didn't I trust them back home? For years, we were obliged to pick up East Germans and send them home on special airplanes organized by the infamous Stasi to take them home, in many cases, to prison or serious harassment. We couldn't keep doing that, certainly not with 100,000 people. We had to find a clear solution. We could, could not keep them here and we could not send them back. The only remaining op option was the unthinkable, to somehow send them to the West but this was bound to provoke not only Erich Honecker and his regime in East Germany, but also the hardliners in Moscow. So what to do, what to do. You know the outcome, Nemes negotiated with West German government, West Germany accepted to take the refugees. The German Chancellor Kohl telephoned with Gorbachev, informing him of Nemes' decision and Gorbachev surprisingly assured Kohl that the Hung Hungarian prime minister was a good man. On 11 September, the border was opened and 30,000 East Germans fled to the West. I remember how we had to empty a whole barracks at Bruchsal by then, where I was stationed, and the arrival of refugees of East Germany in trains at the station, I will also not forget in my life. After the East German regime tried to block the Hungarian route, thousands fled to the West via Czechoslovakia, and there was a massive popular uprising. On 17 October, of this year, Erich Honecker was relieved as head of state of GDR and on 9 November the gates to West Berlin were opened. Why this photo? In this very November I was sent with three comrades to Spain to participate in an exercise. The exercise was called Anti-Guerrilla, by then an absolute novum for German soldiers and it was organized by the Bandera de Operaciones Especiales de la Legión a special unit of the Spanish Foreign Legion. We had also some parachute jumps with them and because of the exercise and the fact that internet, social media and smartphone did not exist by then, did not get us what was happening, what was happening at home. On the morning of the 10th November during a meager Spanish breakfast, suddenly Spanish comrades stormed the room, hugged us and dragged us in front of the TV and we saw the wall had fallen, Germany was reunited. In 1991, I found myself in my first mission abroad. We deployed with parts of the 1st Airborne Division and some helicopter forces to Bachtaran, and it does not fit yet to this picture, but it will fit in a second, in the Kurdish region of Iran. Iran, traditionally with friendly strings to German, Germany still resulting from the Shah regime, accepted Germany's offer help to Kurdish refugees which resulted from the first Iranian-Iraqi war and had fled from Iraq to Iran. I was badly prepared because my passport was just expiring in these days and I had to see the German consulate in Bachteran and they um, developed and they handed me a handwritten passport. I thought this is a bad idea to go to the United States with a handwritten passport of Iran and I renewed it as soon as I was back in Germany to have a proper passport to travel to USA. 
I stayed seven months in Fort Benning, Georgia at the US Infantry School for the Infantry of Advanced Course. And my lesson identified in this time was I do not know enough about my German military history. It was by then politically not wanted in the German armed forces that German soldiers studied the uh, movements and the battles of the First and the Second World War. And my American colleagues asked me about questions. How was that in Kursk and how did you see that? And I spent nights in the library to catch up with them. They were much better than I was. My second mission abroad was with I-4, later called S-4 in Bosnian. I was joint operations shift director in the former Tito residency in Sarajevo uh, from September to December 1996. And this implementation force was a NATO-led multinational peace enforcement force in Bosnia and Herzegovina under the mandate of the United Nations. And what I found significant was that Russian and American troops joined each other on a patrol. You can see here the Russians and the Americans together. Uh, this is in the Bosnian town of Svoring on the afternoon of the 29th February 1996 in this uh, operation and I was impressed and I had far high hopes for a brighter future in military cooperation between NATO and Russia. And also in this time we got new colleagues. I assumed the command of a parachute infantry battalion in Oldenburg in northern Germany and you can see amongst these new colleagues the first Polish officers I could deal with. Vladimir Putin came to power in Russia at the end of the last millennium and by then I did not oversee the consequences in any way. I was looking forward to my first three years assignment abroad in Stavanger in Norway, by then the joint headquarters north of NATO. And with that I switched to the second part of my timeline. The joint headquarters north was responsible for the NATO defense planning at the northern flank of NATO, means the Baltic states, later and Norway and the coastline up to the Russian border. In 2001 this headquarter was tasked with the lead of the so-called Kosovo Force 5 iteration, 5th iteration and I found myself in the headquarters of K4 as Chief J5 plans to do some planning. Nothing dominated my six months in Kosovo as much as the September 11 attacks the series of four coordinated terrorist attacks by the Islamic group Al-Qaeda against the United States on the morning of Tuesday, September 11, 2001. The attack killed 2,996 people, injured over 6,000 and caused at least 10 billion of dollars in infrastructure and property damage. And I still see myself in the office of our assistant chief of staff operation in front of the TV and I couldn't believe what we were seeing there. Suspicion quickly fell on Al-Qaeda. The United States responded by launching the war on terror and invaded Afghanistan to, dispose, to depose the Taliban, which had failed to comply with U.S. demands. On the 13th September, for the first time ever, NATO invoked Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty, the Common Defense. On 18 September 2001, President Bush signed the authorization for use of military force against terrorists, passed by Congress a few days prior. On 20 September 2001, George W. Bush delivered an ultimatum to the Taliban government of Afghanistan, the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, to turn over Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda leaders operating in the country or face an attack. The Taliban demanded evidence of bin Laden's link to the 11 September attacks and such evidence warranted a trial they offered to handle such a trial in an Islamic court. The US refused to provide any evidence. Subsequently, in October 2001, US forces with coalition allies invaded Afghanistan to oust the Taliban regime. After evading capture for almost a decade, Osama bin Laden was located and killed in Pakistan by a SEAL team of the U.S. Navy in May 
11. My next two years of my military life I spent in a highly interesting assignment in the German Ministry of Defense in areas of small arms and light weapons proliferation, control, disarmament, demobilization and reintegration and implementation and development of conventional arms control in Europe. I will come back to this in a couple of minutes because it has something to do with my central lessons identify of my career. And then in summer 2004, I got two offers for a promotional assignment as full colonel. I had the choice between deputy commander airborne school or head of training at the newly erected joint force training center in Bitgosh. I decided to go to Poland. In fall 2004, I started my job there and these years were marked by numerous recce reconnaissance to Afghanistan, but then mainly to Kabul and Kandahar to train staffs of the so-called International Security Assistant Force. This was the NATO-led security mission, um, which is ongoing with a different name until today. Internationally, I should not forget to mention the Russo-Georgian War, the war between Georgia, Russia and the Russian-backed self-proclaimed republics of South Ossetia and Abkhazia. The war took place in August 2008 and it is regarded as the first European war of the 21st century. In fall 2009, I made a big step on the globe and followed the offer to be stationed in Accra in Ghana, the capital of Ghana at the Gulf of Guinea in West Africa. You can see the little flag down in the left corner where it is. I spent my next three years as director of training at the so-called Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center and I was responsible to organize and execute training events for politicians, civilians, police and military from mainly West Africa for peacekeeping missions in this area but also beyond. And the observations which I could make during these years will also play a role in my key finding and experience. The meeting with Kofi Annan, the former 7th Secretary General of the United Nations, for sure a highlight of these days. He lived in Switzerland, but once in a while he visited us in the center where he had agreed to be the name giver. West Africa left a deep impression in me. Never before I had experienced such big differences between extremely poor and extremely rich. This is a slum in Accra, at the old Fadama police station. This is a slum in the harbor area. And these boats are only about three kilometers away from the luxury hotel, the Mervyn Peak Hotel in Accra, where when you're behind the walls, think you're in another world. I also experienced the Mali conflict up close to these years in Ghana. Mali is not so far away. And from Ghana, finally, the journey went back to Germany now as department head of deployment training and mission experience in the German um, headquarters in Joint Forces Operations Command in Potsdam. And this time was internationally dominated by three developments. First, the Russians armed intervention in, Crimea, in the Crimea region and Ukraine. Second, the Islamic State. And third, the European migration crisis. In February 2014, Russia made several military incursions into Ukrainian territory. After the fall of Ukrainian President Viktor Yanukovych, Russian soldiers without insignias took control of strategic positions and infrastructure within the Ukrainian territory of Crimea. Russia then annexed Crimea after a referendum in which Crimea's, Crimeans voted to join the Russian Federation, according to official results. In April, Demonstrations by pro-Russian groups in the Donbas area escalated into an armed conflict between the Ukrainian government and the Russia-backed separatist forces of the self-declared Donetsk and Luhansk People Republics. In August of this year, Russian military vehicles crossed the border in several locations at Donetsk Oblast. The incursion by the Russian military was seen as responsible for the defeat of Ukrainian forces in early September. The Islamic State, IS, or ISIS or ISIL, is a Salafi jihadist militant group. It, it gained global prominence in early 2014 when it drove Iraqi government forces out of key cities in its western Iraq offensive, followed by its capture of Mosul and the Sinjar massacre. The group has been designated 
a terrorist organization by the United Nations and many individual countries, and is widely known for its videos of beheadings and other types of execution, and also, uh, or more, the destruction of cultural heritage sites. This group claimed itself a worldwide caliphate, that means a caliphate, it claimed religious, political and military authority over all Muslims worldwide. The IS was believed to be operational in 18 countries across the world. In 2015, it was estimated to have an annual budget of more than 1 billion US dollars and a force of more than 30,000 fighters. US military officials and simultaneous military analysis reported in December 2017 that the group retained a mere 2% of the territory they had previously held. In December 2017, Iraq's Prime Minister Haya al-Abadi said that Iraqi forces had driven the last remnants of Islamic State from the country three years after the militant group captured about a third of Iraqi's territory. In my third point of this time, the migrant crisis. As you all aware, the German Chancellor Merkel won accolades for her stunning call on September 4, 2015 to keep open Germany doors to hundreds of thousands of asylum seekers, many fleeing war-torn Syria, Syria or Iraq. All of Europe has seen the sea changes since the migration crisis erupted. Nowadays, you see upheavals in European politics everywhere. Despite her, we can do it, cry, Merkel has since agreed to toughening restrictions to curb new arrivals, while the EU as a bloc is seeking to stop migrants landing on its soil. As a result, the influx has slowed considerably. While the numbers of arrivals are down, populist movements are growing everywhere and uh, politicians are building their business model on anti-migration plans. Across the Atlantic, the US president in June also poured fuel on the burning topic by twittering, big mistake, make all over Europe in allowing millions of people in who have so strongly and violently changed their culture. Some analysts warn that not only is Europe's migration crisis not over, it could yet to be undoing of the EU itself. Apart from Boko Haram and civil war, there are other important reasons for immigration, which I have personally experienced during my three years in West Africa. Poverty, unemployment, extreme difference between poor and rich, corruption. Completely unrealistic perceptions of Europe. They all think functional electricity, good roads, big cars, free housing, and money literally laying on the street. Often, it's not the poorest who decide to emigrate because they don't have the money. It's the one of the lower middle class, and if it ever exists, they sell their houses, their cars take loans, and this can be an extreme barrier to come back without money because they just leave their loans apart. The mentality is completely different from ours. A rich African would normally not come to the idea to share a car or to take a railway as we are doing. He would always use his own big car. If you don't have a big car and a nice house in West Africa, you are a loser and you are not respected. Now, here I am at my last assignment of my military career as a special advisor to the Commander Joint Force Training Center, and it's a time to draw a resume. These are my two key experiences. The change of Russian politics and the migration into Europe. In 2003, when I worked in the German Ministry of Defense in the areas of weapons proliferation control and disarmament, we had meetings with Russian delegations in Brussels, in Vienna, even in Moscow. And for me as a soldier, a non-diplomat, so to say, it was significant to experience during the brief talks with the American, the British and the French delegations, that when a proposal was well received by the Russian sides, the prevailing attitude of, on our side, on the Western side, was that the proposal should have been made more restrictive. Because otherwise, why would there actually interested or inter of interest for the Russian side. And I personally think, still think, if Russia had been treated differently by the West in these years after the Soviet Union breakdown, history may have developed a little bit differently. If you think back, the Treaty of Versailles from 28 June 1919, which brought the World War I to an end, rightly required Germany to accept the responsibility of Germany and her allies 
for causing all the loss and damage during the war known as the War Guilt Clause. The later National Socialist dictatorship in Germany used it to develop the perception amongst the German population of a dictated peace. And I see parallels what happened in Russia. On 30 December 1999, a program article signed by Putin, the new Prime Minister, Russia at the turn of the millennium was published on the government website. I kindly ask you if you can read the red markings here. This is what Putin mentioned by then. He ends with the words, Russia was and will remain a great power. It is preconditioned by the inseparable characteristics of its geopolitical, economic and cultural existence. And Putin has proven 18 years later that he meant this very serious. He may not have been read by too many people. Now, if you look at it from the other side, of course, under Yeltsin, Russian pursued a policy of grudging cooperation with NATO. And all that changed under Putin. Putin has insisted that NATO's eastward expansion represents a threat to his country. And he built the muscles to push back. If you look on this map, you can see the expansion of NATO towards the east till 1990 and then over 2004, 2009. I, I regret that it's not very well readable. The newly aggressive stance of Putin has worried Poland and the Baltics as well the Nordic countries. Even Sweden and Finland have started musing aloud about joining NATO and participated in the just finished exercise Trident Juncture in Norway, which was just finished a week ago, the largest, largest NATO exercise since the end of the Cold War era. Putin's position has huge backing in Russia, but of course it ignores one crucial factor. The big difference is that all these countries you see here in yellow, in blue and in orange, they wanted to become a NATO member. And I doubt that this is the case with the public majority in Georgian provinces, the Crimea or the eastern Ukraine. The upheaval in the Middle East and North Africa has escalated into sustained violence by state and non-state actors. The export of religious violence went beyond this region and sparked a flood of refugees and migrants. People always migrated because of poverty, starvation and other catastrophes. Whatever we are developing abroad, migration won't be stopped. We have to deal with it either way. In Europe, the turmoil caused by popular resistance to the ongoing arrival emigrates, emigrants in an acceptably large numbers in combination with some economic distance in the Eurozone has in my mind the potential to jeopardize the survival of the European Union itself. I found this one quote in red, interesting, saying, for the United States, immigration is a problem. For Europe, it's a revolution and not one likely to lead to a brighter future. Let's quickly look into some figures. If you look at the worldwide statistics of people living outside of their birth country, it means emigrates, 10 sub-Saharan African countries with the largest growth of emigrants between 2010 and 2017. Then you only see Syria as the only non-African country growing fastest or faster in the time frame 2010 to 2017. All others are African countries of the Sub-Sahara region. The figures which we face since 2010 in terms of Asylum applications from Sub-Sahara Africa in thousands is not so alarming. And I can see it goes even a little bit back in the, two year, in the year 2017 to 168,000. However, if you look how population will grow in the next decades in Sub-Sahara from a population from 1.1 billion in Sub-Sahara to 2.1 billion in 2050 in the Arab world from 432 million to 650 million and you look into how many people want to move 
and this is about 50%, if they have the means and tools to do so, then this gets into a new light and it's highly likely that the numbers of migration towards Europe will permanently raise in the long term. On the other hand, if you look into some statistical figures in Germany, you can see that we have 82 million inhabitants and this is a bit more than the years before and this has also to do with migration. From these 82 millions we feed 8 millions with public financial support, hearts for social welfare because they cannot work or they don't want to work and we have 4.4 million who are older than 80 years. So we have about 50 million who can work or who work and produce some goods somebody in, in, in the age uh, of, 60, of, of 20 to, to 65. Now in the year 2060 we will have 9 million who are older than 80 years and our birth rate deficit, deficit sorry, uh, is still between 150 and 190 uh, persons population yearly that means every year 170,000 old people die or people die more than little childs are born, children are born. So we, you could say if nothing happens and if we don't make use of immigration, Germany as a nation will somehow die in the next hundred years or so because we don't have enough Germans anymore. So these are my lessons identified for the future. First to NATO Russia. I'm living now in a front state because Poland became a front state in the front line of NATO if you want so. Look to Kaliningrad or to your easterly neighbors. NATO must seek a dialogue from a position of strength. However, we must not forget the famous forgetting uh, Winston Churchill a little bit wrongly quoted. He said, Georgia is better than World War. That means you always have to talk. The Russian leadership needs to be forced to re-evaluate the costs and risks of continuing its more assertive military posture and Western diplomacy should be aimed at persuading Russia to move into this direction. All sides should exercise military and political restraint and this includes both political and military to military combination, communication and transparency. And based on participation in recent exercises I'm quite confident I have started to do we have started to do all this, the NATO and NATO is fully in the process to return to its original tasks and values. And the second point is the migration. This is my experience. Whatever we are developing abroad in Africa and elsewhere, migration won't be stopped in the long run. I have talked to many people and they all think a wrong posture, a wrong picture of Europe. It only exists in paradise as they think. And the figures which I showed you I think speak for themselves. We have to deal with it either way and we better learn how to do it best for the future for the benefit of our countries, of our people. That ends my briefing. Cinque Bazo, so wagao.